Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. This is Kate Barlow, host of the uh, OT Mentorship Program. Today with us, we have Dr. Myers, and she's um, talking to us today about upper extremity rehabilitation. This is part two of her lecture. And um, I will be sending out an email asking you all to complete a survey that um, is for the study we are doing about the efficacy of this telementoring project. So thank you all for being here today. Hi, Dr. Myers. Hi. All right, so um, last time um, we talked about the idea of upper extremity rehabilitation in the area of physical disabilities. Um, and um, so the first couple slides just kind of summarizing what we were talking about. But the idea as OTs then, we still look through that uh, holistic lens um, and the importance of collaboration with our patients to determine what it is that they need to do and want to do and um, how we are going to address them through purposeful, meaningful activity. We, uh, we do focus on the biomechanical frame of reference within this area of practice. That does not mean though it's, it's the sole uh, frame of reference or a model used, um, but it is really that it really does align well with the ideas of strength, endurance, coordination, flexibility. And um, so that is the basis that because of some limitation with the person in those areas, they are unable to perform um, their set activities. And so, um, this evaluation process that is looking at ways to figure out exactly what's going on with the client um, with regard to these areas and um, which again helps us determine the goals for, for overall treatment. So um, last time we talked about um, range of motion, we talked about grip and we talked about manual muscle testing and pain. And today we're going to um, um, a, a pinch, excuse me. Today we're going to talk about uh, pain and sensation and then some evaluation tools to determine that, and then sort of hopefully tie some of it all together. So uh, when we think of our do uh, domains of pain, um, there's just different terminology that you may be familiar with and you may use. And um, so terms like pain is really what, what's perceived by our patients, um, and that's the input that's given from our nervous system. Um, suffering is an effective response to pain, and then behaviors in, in terms of pain is what the patient does say, or maybe not, or not what they say. It's how they move, how they look, facial expressions. And so in our documentation, then we just need to be clear exactly what's happening. Um, if they're not really talking about it, but you're really watching them and how they're moving and what, what they're kind of saying, that's definitely a behavior. Uh, pain in of itself is, is how the person themselves perceives the input that's coming from their nervous system. The word suffering is a word that definitely evokes a whole lot of emotions in people. So again, if our patient uses the term suffering, by all means, it's reasonable to use in terms of our documentation, but it would not be a way we would want to describe pain in somebody. For example, oh, they seem like they're, very, they're suffering because again, that's our opinion. Um, and how, we do, how I define suffering would certainly be different than other people. And of course, that's based on our own personal background and our own personal perceptions. So um, suffering when our patients use it, by all means, is, is a reasonable word for pain, but it would not be the, uh, a word if we're using, um, if we're trying to be objective with regard to pain. Um, so when we think of acute pain, uh, physiological, psychological, um, and behavioral, it all kind of ties in. Um, we think of tissue irritation or damage due to something that happened, whether it be an injury, disease, a disability, um, or some sort of rehab procedure or, or process. You know, um, many of my clients, you know, I'm seeing them you know, days after surgery. Of course, they're in acute pain because they just had something we could argue positively done in order to help improve their overall function. But of course, there's still gonna be pain because an invasive procedure has occurred. We think of acute pain again, it's well-defined. Um, it's biologic, meaning that there's, you know, specific attention to the injury, irritation or disease, and um, there may need to be uh, time for immobilization or protection when, when something's acute. It's also predictable. And from an occupational therapy perspective, whether it be our evaluation or treatment, that's good news. It meaning that it responds well to meds and it responds well to our intervention because of its localized um, and specificness. Chronic pain um, um, is, is persistent. Um, it may or may not begin as acute. Uh, it is also biologic 
Um, but with, with chronic then, we have to consider other parts of our, our people we're working with because um, people that have chronic pain, there can be changes in their personality, in their lifestyle, and in their function. Meaning if they're living with pain all the time, that definitely can take a toll on them <clears throat> emotionally, mentally, and certainly on the people around them um, and the activities that they like to do. Um, or, um, or work or, you know, the care for family. And, and along with that, of course, uh, the inability to maybe do um, uh, the activities that are important to them in the way that they like to do them. There are all kinds of pain measures and they are easily accessible um, on, you can get them online. Um, and pain, pain measures are all self-report, right? Um, it's what the patient tells us um, with regard to pain. We as occupational therapists though, we wanna think about, and we may guide them in this way. We're not, we're not asking them, we don't wanna ask, uh, tell them that they have sharp pain or your pain is sharp, right? Or you, that it's really throbbing, right? We don't wanna, we don't wanna sort of um, guide them to say something, but we do, we do wanna guide them if we're not getting the information we need specific to, well, how often does it happen? Where do you feel the pain? Does it feel worse at different times of day? How long does it last? What helps it? What makes it worse? So we can definitely give those guided questions then so that the information, so the pain can really help us again when we're deciding on goals and intervention. Um, it's also worth considering their past and current treatments because, um, you know, uh, Someone may say something like, well, you know, I know I, um, you know, I fractured my olecranon when I fell. Um, but I know what that's going to be like because I've had elbow pain before. So the concern sometimes with that is people, you know, equate pain with um, if they've had pain in a certain area and then, then a different type of injury happens, it's hard for them to separate that. So I'm, I'm usually clear to say, well, right, I know that you've had pain in your elbow in the past, but, you know, this is a different type of injury and the reason you have pain is for this reason. And so sometimes if we can take the time and explain to them why um, they may be in pain or the reasons for it or even saying to them, you know, it's okay to be in pain because you just hurt yourself um, or you've just had surgery or, or you're in the middle of recovery. Sometimes that, that, that helps them. So there's all types of assessments and I, I explain them um, in the next few slides. Um, I use the abbreviations on the, on the slide header, but they are here for you. And again, information is easily accessible about them. They've been around since 1950, so they're not new. And so we'll talk a little bit about some of the thoughts with that, but um, so they're well used, uh, well studied, um, and used, and 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 they've been. They're also uh, in a variety of languages, and um, there's also uh, actual pictures for for people that may not be able to read or to understand. So they use um, or with children. So um, again, these scales are reproducible, and again, there's so many different types of them. So these are some of the top four. Um, and there's different versions of some of the, the, like the visual analog and the verbal rating and numerical rating. You may see some different versions, but again, there are standard versions for them as well. And they have been around for a real long time. So um, with regard to the McGill uh, pain questionnaire, it's, that's a self-report questionnaire. And um, it, really, um, it really is asking um, patients to think of pain in a broader sense. And so they are asked to pick words from different groups that they feel best reflects their pain. Um, and they have, so this grouping then, um, they're asked to pick two or three words from, uh, or actually one to three words, depending on the group, um, as to what they feel best represents their pain. At the end, they've selected seven words that best describe their pain. And some of these words are used more than once, meaning they're in more than one of the categories. Um, and so what we're really looking at is sensory and affective and evaluative when we start looking at the words that were chosen to describe pain. And um, it's really trying to uh, specify their subjective pain experience. And um, it also includes intensity scales um, and other aspects to really look at their experience with regard to pain. Um, interesting thing, this has been around, gosh, you know, uh, 90, almost 80 years, right? Um, and so some of, the, some of the things to think about with this, some of the words, right, may not quite make sense, but examples here are, um, terms that people may identify with as to how to describe their, their pain in the different categories. So you see, for example, in the, in the temporal uh, category, palpating and throbbing. 
And then when you go into the affective category, which is category four here listed, um, the word ugly. So again, there's different ways that people um, uh, may think to describe their pain. And, um, and this, this gives a, like a broad reach then to, to best capture information um, about um, your patient's pain. The visual analog scale um, is easily understood. It compares well with other pain assessments and it gives you reliable and repeatable results. Um, so what this means is if you, if you, it gives the same rating to, this, uh, to the same amount of pain. And so again, um, and it's because it's easy to understand and pretty quick to fill out, um, it's definitely something that is, is used pretty frequently. Uh, the numerical rating scale, uh, pa pa patients are asked now to rate on a scale of zero to 10. Um, we describe the words, zero being no pain and 10 being the worst imaginable pain. Um, the thing that's important here though is to really use those words, right? Um, because um, your patients may say something like, well, what is, the, what is the worst imaginable pain? And what I consider to be the worst imaginable pain may be very different than what my client uh, thinks the worst imaginable pain is or, um, you know, other therapists think. So again, if we can just stick to that. And so some of the answers I've said is like, um, you know, I've heard, you know, therapists say and um, things like, well, it's like having a heart attack. Well, I've never had a heart attack. So it, it, it's tough to say that I'm using that because I, I think it could be painful. I've talked to people since who have had a heart attack and they've said, yeah, I didn't really even know. I felt a little pressure, but it wasn't a big deal. So, um, so now I just think the most important thing as the OT is just to be able to say to them, well, I'm really asking what is the worst imaginable pain that you feel and use that as your guide when, when rating that on the number scale. And so um, when we start talking about uh, the uh, verbal rating scale, we start thinking about the idea of listing adjectives. And, and when we start thinking about increasing pain uh, intensities, um, we, we have words that just, just caveat the pains versus like, uh, which I mean, no pain to mild pain to moderate, to severe or intense pain. And then these are assigned numbers. And so actually you can take these scales and line them up and what it, which, and I've done this with patients, which I think is really pretty interesting. And I've done it in lab here in, in, at the college with my students is that I have them fill out the different scales. And when you do line them up, they really do line up uh, pretty consistently, which I think is very interesting. So again, um, the, the, the variety of scales are good because what it does is it gives our, our patients an opportunity to um, best, uh, for us to best call the information regarding their pain. Um, without a doubt, we understand as occupational therapists, the pain is subjective, of course. Um, and, and this is a way to sort of objectify it a bit. And it certainly allows us to be able to write goals and certainly plan our interventions. So for example, if our patients are saying that they describe the pain on a scale of three to 10 with activity, certainly a goal can be to perform the activity um, and work to decrease the pain, you know, to a one or two, for example. So there is ways to measure it. Um, and there's, and there's ways to, to, um, you know, uh, objectified enough so that it can be used for our goals in treatment. We understand as OTs, of course, the pain definitely, definitely has an impact and an influence certainly on, on occupational therapy treatment, but as it does with um, our patients performing um, their daily routine tasks. When we think of sensation, um, it's, it's significant to everything we do. Right, it, um, it certainly impacts safety as well as motor performance. And so when we think of sensation, we just wanna give it its broad due. You know, we, we, we obviously understand sensation or we should understand sensation from the perspective of tactile. You know, we touch something that's hot or something that's sharp, we pull our hand away. You know, we say, ow, ow, that hurt, you know. Um, but sensation um, is also considered specific to auditory and visual and olfactory and gustatory as, and vestibular. So we just want to remember that while our first thought about sensation is tactile, it, there, is a, um, there is a wide berth to consider. From a OT perspective, um, it's considered a body function, and it definitely has an influence um, with regard to performance um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, processing, as well as just the actual motor, um, the movement part. Um, 
we understand that receptors, um, we have mechanical receptors, um, mechanical receptors um, are stimulated by mechanical deformation, and that would include um, touch and pressure, stretch and vibration. And um, sort of the big two, then there's thermoreceptors, which is stimulated by heat and cold. So we understand that, that we have these somatosensory receptors then that respond to stimuli, and that they're different depending on the stimuli that, um, that has been injected. Um, for our intents here in these, uh, when we consider upper extremity rehab, we think of, uh, in, a, in a FISDIS way, we think of superficial sensation, uh, cutaneous sensation, and that involves pain, you know, temperature, touch, distal aspect of our body, because there's high densities of these receptors that I just talked about, and a smaller receptive field. And so I guess how I would think of that, um, think of living out you know, in the country, um, you know, far away from a city, um, you know, um, where people live are, are more spread apart. Uh, there's more land in between. Um, and um, while there's people, they're not so close. And then think of, think of dense populations in some of our big cities. People are much closer. Their, house, their housing is really much closer and, and it's easier. That's, so that would be considered high density receptors living in a big city and small recept, uh, in a small receptive field, meaning a lot of people and a lot of homes in a small area uh, in, of land. And then if you think of, um, and, and if you think of the opposite, it'd be out in the country, we would have less density of receptors and in a larger receptor field. And so you can understand them like these mechanoreceptors or those thermoreceptors I just talked about, if there's a higher density of them over a small area, for example, our fingers, um, we are gonna have a better, a better, more acute feel um, for temperature, for pain, the ability to touch and be able to figure out what's happening. Um, and again, these happen at our distal extremities. Um, our, uh, when we consider superficial sensation, um, we as an occupational therapist and within this frame of reference, we're, we're, we're about adapting and compensating, modifying so people are able to perform what's important to them. And so you want to start thinking about um, compensatory techniques and teaching and your concerns with regard to sensation is, you know, our observation skills at first minutes with our patient, the time we spend talking to them and getting to know them, you know, we're also looking at them. We're going to be looking at their hands, for example. Do they have blisters? Are, does one hand seem more sweaty than the other? Does one hand seem a whole lot drier than the other? Are there a lot of calluses? What does the skin look like? Are there any scars or are there any wounds? And these can be early signs that as you look at somebody's hand, especially if one's, you know, uh, different than the other, um, you start to think something's not going on right. And, you know, and, and it, it might get you to think that it requires uh, further evaluation specific to sensation. So again, as we do with any, with any of our patients, right, um, we really want to talk to them about what's going on. You want to get a history prior to testing. And so you just want to ask those general questions like, um, has anything been going on? And, you know, um, Sometimes a patient may see this a decreased sensation. Uh, they don't know they have it, but the idea they may say things to you like, wow, yeah, you know, I was walking by my gas stove uh, the other day, you know, and wow, it was really hot and I, I didn't even feel it. And I had like a little burn on the, um, you know, the little finger side of my hand or um, they're like, yeah, you know, I can really touch things that are cold now and keep my hand there. I never could do that before. Or um, wow, I walked by, um, you know, I walked by a table and there was a, there was a piece of like metal that was sticking out. I didn't even feel it. And I, you know, I cut my hand. So that's when pa patients start to feel concerned when they may burn themselves or they may have cut themselves. Um, if they're able to hold things that are cold or hot that they may not have been able to do before, sometimes they see that as a bit more positive. They're like, wow, I was able to hold that a little bit longer than I could before. So, um, but again, if there's any you know, wounds that tend to happen, that, that's sometimes a reason that they feel like, mm, I maybe need to get it checked. When we're testing for sensation then, um, it, the, the area for sensation needs to be quiet. And I refer back to that slide a couple slides ago that talked about sensation is influenced by sound um, and light and you know, what, we, what visual stimulation. So um, 
the area of really we want to we want to try to decrease um, as much of the environmental stimuli as we can. And again, that's only to help us to get the most accurate information. Um, so um, the setting should be quiet. Um, the testing instruments um, should be in good working order. Um, it's important that the patient's hand is supported. Now, um, when we're testing, though, if I'm holding my patient's hand, I can't be moving my hand or gripping tighter to one part of the patient's hand or like tapping my finger against their hand because that is going to influence the results in a negative way um, of my sensory testing, right? So they need support, but there shouldn't be any movement. And you as the therapist do not want to give them any sensory input because that could override um, the information that you're trying to get as to their status um, of, their, of, of the sensory distribution. And again, because we want to you know, decrease sensory input, we, you know, auditorily wise, that's the quiet setting. And we also want to make sure that they're not looking and um, seeing as you touch them. There are all, all sorts of elaborate um, kits um, that are out there for sensation, but in our labs here too, you know, you can have very simple, simple uh, uh, ways to test sensation. Um, we have used a, the, the, the head of an eraser. I've used a paper clip like the round side as well as the, um, as the more pointy side, for example, to work on sharp and dull. Um, I've actually had a, a, a piece of metal a uh, round piece of metal that I put in the freezer. And then I have put a piece of foam on one side and I can test cold in that way. Um, so there's ways that you can actually make up your own sensory kit um, and, and to get the, get the information. Um, I, when I did this um, last month, um, uh, one of the questions was asking about modalities. So I did add a section about modalities. Um, the term therapeutic modalities versus physical agent modalities. You know, when I was in school and starting to study, um, physical agent modalities was the terminology, uh, or PAM for short. Um, but it's it's really uh, morphed to now to be called therapeutic modalities. And I think that resonates better with us as occupational therapists then, right? Because when we think of the ther attaching that therapeutic title to modalities, you start to think about the inclusiveness of the benefits to the patient. Whereas before um, it was really focused on what exactly or what kind of modality it was. So I think having the term therapeutic modalities really gives it more broad reaching um, thought. So what do we use them for? Well, they're used to enhance to enhance function or to improve function, to help decrease pain. So they can use to help with stretching and strengthening, neuromu uh, neuromuscular re-education, balance, mobilizations, and patient education. There's a whole variety of modalities and like, like uh, the first part of um, today's lecture as well as the one I did uh, last month, this is really just meant to give you an overview and just give you a bit of a guide um, to help you through the um, evaluation process. So um, the American Occupational Therapy Association definitely has a position on therapeutic modalities, and I, I just thought it was reasonable to leave this in here. Um, it, um, because um, I know here it is a constant discussion. Um, there's definitely occupational therapists that believe that uh, there isn't a place, is not a place uh, for therapeutic modalities in occupational therapy treatment and interventions. And um, then there's the other school that says of uh, therapists that says, oh my gosh, absolutely, yes, um, we should use modalities. And so um, I personally are on that school. I just think that if there's, if, there's, if there's stuff out there that we can use in, in our toolbox in any way that can in, help enhance our clients' participation um, to make them feel more productive and uh, ultimately more happy uh, and um, you know, involved in their life, um, I think we should go for it. I, I don't think, if, you know, I don't think we, again, if we keep, if we always keep in mind that everything we're doing, because modalities would fall in, in, the, in OT it, as a preparatory, it prepares our patient for 
certain activities, right? And so I think in that fashion, if we, if we keep in mind um, what the reason is and how to use modalities, I think it absolutely makes entire sense, at least to me. So as a result of the modality choices we as OT makes, we, have, we are going to influence the biophysiological, um, the neurophysiological, and the electrophysiological changes that can happen inside the body. And then there's whole lots of um, modalities um, uh, from superficial to electrotherapeutic and to deep. Um, for today's talk, we're just gonna talk about hot and cold and ultrasound. So uh, there's an argument for, uh, for occupational therapists, it's, uh, it, and this is what I think. Um, the, it's our ethical responsibility to use new technology intervention to facilitate occupational performance. An argument against uh, modalities is it's not consistent with the basic philosophy of occupation, which is the use of purposeful activity to influence health and healing. And alone, they do not address the basic needs of independence with daily activity. And I do agree with that second statement. And so I think that we just have to remember that if, if it's a choice um, and we only have so much time with our client, putting a hot pack on their shoulder may not be the best use of our time um, as occupational therapists. You know, So we want to do what we can do uh, to facilitate healing and performance um, while developing that collaborative relationship with our clients or our patients um, and um, you know, placing them on a hot pack and then just leaving them to sit while, uh, while you move on to something else um, by no means does that. Um, but I have, um, you know, because of time constraints, for example, you know, worked with my patient in a collaborative way and then asked them if they really feel, um, um, if they want the hot pack and there, I feel there's a benefit for it and it makes sense. Um, you know, I've, I've asked patients either to come early or I may have them, you know, stay late um, for that. So, so again, I think remember that modalities are meant to be preparatory, you know, for, again, preparing our clients for function. A little bit small here. So cryotherapy or cold um, is used um, for acute injuries, right? Trauma to decrease spasticity and spasms and edema. And there's lots of different examples and uh, we'll talk about a few of them. There's cold packs, there's ice massage, there's cold water immersion baths, whirlpool, ice towels, and there's vapor coolant sprays. You know, there's actual sprays that when you, you know, spray them, they're very, very, they feel very cold on your skin, but it, it's not really long lasting. Um, a nice massage is used to anesthetize a small area. It's really to help dis, uh, disrupt a pain cycle, right? Um, think about having even something um, itchy, uh, you know, a bug bite or something. And if you put ice on it, it, it helps with the itch and you're able to, um, you know, continue on. You're able to touch the area without scratching. Um, so ice massage can anesthetize the area, uh, a small area, and help decrease um, or disrupt the pain cycle. There's four types of cold packs, <coughs> excuse me, and um, you can make them um, and certainly uh, as well as they're for purchase as well, but really crushed ice. And, and so it's ice in a plastic cloth. Um, you know, you got to think of the temperature range that you want. Um, it's most effective and it extracts the greatest amount of heat. Um, you want to make sure though that you're not putting ice directly on, on somebody. And again, especially if there's decreased sensation um, because you don't want to cause any sort of ice burn. Um, but again, it's just ice. And then I have had patients, um, you know, put them in a bag, a plastic bag, and you can crush it. Um, you know, I've used, I've used hammers. I, you know, I've stepped on ice to, to crush it. Um, there's also gel packs. Those are the most common used here in, in, in most clinical settings have at least that. And it's kind of a, a water mixed with like an antifreeze or alcohol um, combination. And it's got a vinyl covering over it and they're, they're kept in a freezer. The key with these are they're reusable, of course, but you need to be sure that that um, for them to be therapeutic, that there's a system in place that that if you've used a, if you've used one of these gel cold packs, that you give it time to get cold again to the to the therapeutic level. So that takes about thirty minutes. So I know there has to there has to really be a plan if you have one or two or four, whatever amount you have, that they need to be rotated and everyone's on on page with how you do that because um, if if I've used it and then the therapist behind me just grabs it, you know, five minutes later, it's not gonna have the therapeutic value um, to the patient um, that it would if it, if, if it had the chance to get really cold again. Um, and so, um, 
you just want to be cautious of bony prominences when you're using these packs, as we know they're especially in the upper extremity and, and certainly even in the lower extremity as well, that uh, bony prominences, um, you know, we don't want that to get more cold. And um, we understand the absorption factor changes from skin to bone, and that's a factor. Um, and just the protection layer that's over bony prominences, because we, again, we don't want to cause any sort of burn, ice burn. There's artificial ice packs as well. Um, and um, people have made these as well. Um, they look a bit like, um, I don't know, like a, like a beehive. Um, I've actually seen them even made with cardboard, you know, corrugated cardboard that has those air pockets in them, um, you know, um, so that you can literally fill those air um, pockets in corrugated cardboard or with water and freeze it. And, and now what you've, you've achieved is that um, because of the, you know, the little bits of vertical cardboard between two horizontal pieces of cardboard, the water fits in almost like a beehive, looks like a, a, like a, a honeycomb, but you can freeze water in those and um, there's not a lot of flexibility with that, but, um, but you can get um, a, um, a more effective ice use than you would with the crushed ice, but again, they can easily be made. Um, then there's the crushable ice packs um, that um, they, they, they have a little pouch within like a liquid um, and they're commercially bought. And um, so it's, it's a chemical reaction that occurs. And um, those are, you know, cold for a little bit of time, um, but it, not so much long lasting. You can make your own too. It's a, a four to one ratio with water to rubbing alcohol. Um, the mixture is flexible and it's semi-solid and you can keep it in some sort of home freezer. Again, it needs to be cold enough though to get that effect. And of course you have to be sure that it's sealed, but um, I've had patients make them, putting them in like a, a plastic bag that has like a, a closure on it. And then I've actually used tape to cover the whole thing so there is no leakage because of the alcohol. And, um, and so, um, that's worked really, really well. I've used like um, like electrical tape or duct tape. And so again, done this ratio in a, in a Ziploc bag, sealed it, and then just used tape over the bag. And you, you, it's obviously reusable and you can put them in the freezer. Um, Another thing that can work is frozen vegetables. Um, if they're putting like, especially peas or corn, um, because those are really malleable. And um, there's been studies saying that those are actually better than gel packs. Um, but what, what's great about that is that you can, um, you know, they can be any of those kinds of vegetables that are round like that. And um, again, putting them in a zip, zip or plastic bag, you can keep them in a, in a freezer and they're reusable. You just want to mark, make sure that people know they can't eat them because that could be a problem if they've been frozen and they're unfrozen, they're frozen again. But it's absolutely reusable and just a very quick, you know, inexpensive way um, to, um, and these vegetables, I'm sorry, would be uncooked. I probably should have wrote that down. Um, you would not use anything mushy, so it would not be cooked or cooked peas or corn, but actually um, peas and corn that have not been cooked. Um, put them in a plastic bag, freeze them, then each piece of corn or, or pea freezes, and then you can actually mold those, you know, the, the pieces around uh, the body that you want to ice. So cold um, increases your pain threshold and, and decreases pain sensation. And I think it's important just to understand what's happening. Uh, uh, so when we're working with our clients, we better understand what cold can do to, to help them. Um, cold, cold affects the neuromuscular function by decreasing nerve conduction. It increases uh, the pain thresholds, right? So because it decreases pain sensation, they're able to tolerate more, right? Their threshold for pain goes up a bit, right? It's the opposite. Um, it, um, it helps with spasticity and um, facilitating muscle contraction, getting rid of inflammation. And it's really, uh, it's really the, the most effective um, with uh, traumatic or, uh, or acute injuries that happen um, in the first um, 24 to 48 hours. The disadvantage, of course, of any of these cold packs you, you do have to look at patient's skin and the packs can be heavy. Um, sometimes um, um, it's hard to maintain even or good contact, especially if the area you're trying to ice is small. But I've, I've again made so many ice packs in my time and I just use smaller bags for smaller areas. And um, again, the duration of time, because really they're on for a couple, you know, they're on for a little bit of time and sometimes for people they it, it, it's you know they want quick quick results um the advantages of a gel pack are they're easy to use and not 
they can be inexpensive um, and um, they can be effective with regard to time. Um, again, just depending on your base of reference. Um, it, you don't need a whole lot of uh, uh, training in order to, ap to apply them. And you can make them for different sizes so they can be used um, for different size application. So to use it, um, you wanna make sure you position your patient uh, comfortably. Um, you want to remove the area, uh, uh, clothing from the area you're trying to treat. Make sure you, that the, the ice pack is relative to the size you're, that you're treating. Um, you want to place the pad on, on a dry or wet towel, depending on what you're trying to achieve. Of course, if something's wet, um, it's going to bring out the cold more. Um, you want to cover all parts of the cold pack. So again, the, that um, it's even distribution. Um, and then place the cold area uh, pack on the treatment area. Um, you are going to have to put, you do want to wrap it in a towel. Um, and um, so the pack is not um, directly on, on our client's um, skin. And again, the treatment does vary just depending on what you're trying to achieve. If, again, the goal is analgesia, it's gonna take a bit more time. Recognizing though that putting a hot pack on really, in my opinion, you know, really roughly 15-ish minutes, uh, you know, kind of past that time, they, they sometimes lose, you know, just because of the, uh, of the warming, um, it may not be as effective. So, you know, you would not, like tell somebody, oh, we'll keep the ice on you a half hour or so because really the, the effects of the cold does change um, over time. Be, be cautious, um, like with anything, with any of these modalities, if, if, you're, if your patient has a thermoregulatory problem or any sort of sensory deficit, you've already assessed them sensory-wise. And so if you notice a deficit that they, they can't distinguish between sharp and dull or hot and cold, that may not be your best line of uh, defense to use. And if you are gonna use cold, you really wanna monitor the skin and monitor them because you may not be able to get, they may not be able to give you good feedback as to what they're feeling specific to the cold. And remember, if you looked at their sensation and in your, in your opinion, your professional opinion after assessment that they've um, uh, have decreased sensation, well, then you, then you, then you, then the next part you should figure out is that, well, if they're not really feeling it well, they're not going to be good historians about the cold. They're not because they, they don't feel it, right? And so you don't want to cause more problems. Um, if they have impaired circul circulation or hypertension, again, reasons to proceed with caution. Um, and then I just listed some, again, not an inclusive list, but, you know, tried to give it a, a lot. So there's precautions versus contraindications, um, and, and they're listed, um, and they are listed there for you. I want to talk a bit about heat, uh, thermal therapy, uh, for decreasing pain, increasing range of motion, increasing flexibility, and tendon excursion. Um, examples are whirlpool or flutotherapy, paraffin, hot packs. So what does heat also has an analgesic effect by reducing pain and elevating your pain tolerance. Um, it's, it's vascular in nature, you're increasing blood flow to the area, which helps decrease muscle spasm and uh, reducing ischemia. Um, it, has a meta, it also has a, a metabolic effect. Um, so you're transferring heat actually through conduction. And the effect of depth for hot packs is about one centimeter. And it can raise the subcutaneous soft tissue temperature uh, to approximately 39 degrees Fahrenheit. There's a silica gel covered by a canvas pouch. The temperature these need to be stored at is, 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 is warm, 104 to 113 Fahrenheit. Um, you want, again, just like the cold packs, they need to be heated uh, at least 30 minutes for effective use between treatments, right? And there's a special machine that's used to store it uh, called hydrochlorinated that has the water in it and it's, it's run at a pretty high temperature. Again, treatment's about 20 minutes. So again, the same kind of range is cold. Uh, disadvantages, um, you do have to, you really wanna pay attention to skin inspection, the weight of the hot pack um, and the contoured areas. Um, um, Advantages to hot pack use is application. Again, easy to use. It can be effective time. They're not expensive. And there's not a lot of skill in terms of training that needs to be done to use them. People can use them at home. And so again, moving clothing. Um, with The key here though is with our patients, somebody might say to you, oh, I love when it's warm. I love when it's hot. I don't need all those towels. And we need to understand that these uh, hot packs have been sitting in a hydroculator that's, that's upwards of 157 degrees. So they're, they're very hot. And so while 
when you first place it, you may not get the full sense of that heat within minutes that heat, that hot heat is being transferred over. And so we don't want our patients to get burned. And so um, you do want to have that thickness, um, six to eight layer thickness between the skin and the hot pack. And again, like anything, it's about a conversation and explaining what's happening. So your patient's on the same page as you, but you want them to be comfortably warm. There should be a mild to moderate sensation to heat. It's not like they shouldn't feel like it's just about burning them and they got to grit their teeth to get through it. And that, that definitely could be a problem in terms of causing burns. Um, you don't want your client to fully put their body weight. So for example, if you're, if you're, if you're heating something on the, in their buttock region, you certainly wouldn't want them to sit on the hot pack because that would increase the heat uh, and the risk of burning. And even after um, heat has an effect on skin, so you would encourage your patient to, to look at their skin and keep an eye on the skin um, even um, after the treatment's done. And depending on the intensity of the heat, how contraindications are affected. But again, our patients with impaired sensation, patients with poor thermal regulation, people, uh, patients with tumors or have had cancer, DVT, um, infection, um, a primary ligament or tendon repair. And again, not an inclusive list, but gives you an idea then that um, like any modality, you need to respect it and make sure you're taking that good history with your patients so you know best what to do. Um, again, it's about treating the size, the right size, so the right hot pack for the size. Um, the de determine the duration as to how long you plan to leave the hot pack on. Um, and so that is, and that's important um, to make sure you're, you're aware of. When we're talking about um, ultrasound, um, ultrasound um, what is um, now, um, so hot and cold is a thermal modality. And when we think of ultrasound, we're heading into a deep modality. And um, while not hard to use, um, uh, if you don't understand how to use it, it's not going to be effective. Um, it has, like I said, it has it, ultrasound has a both thermal and a non-thermal effect, and these and and that's listed here for you is to and so you as the therapist have to determine what you're wanting to achieve. Is it a thermal effect or a non-thermal effect, and um and that's that's part that's part of um, determining um, what um, what intensity you plan to set the ultrasound at. So um, ultrasound, um, it, it delivers a rate of energy. It's represented in watts per centimeter square. Um, and the maximum recommended is dependent on the BNR. Um, and that's the, um, that's the ratio um, of the beam. And what is something you have to figure out. It's already stated for you on, these, on the ultrasounds. And really from your perspective, um, what you're doing is trying to determine what you're trying to do. Are you trying to elevate temperature? Um, um, what are you trying to promote healing? Or get rid of edema? Like what is the purpose of um, what you're doing with the ultrasound? Um, that's the intensity. The duration of course is the length of time of treatment. And then um, frequency is the number of oscillations that occur over a second. Again, nothing you have to figure out, um, but it, 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 it's what's happening. Um, the rate of the electrical impulse is delivered into the crystal, um, determines the frequency and um, the length of the wave and contributes to depth penetration. Again, not something you have to determine, it's all done, but why I'm stating it is I just think it's important to understand that it's more than having a ultrasound head and just rubbing it up and down on, on somebody's body. Um, there's stuff that actually is happening um, in terms, and so, when we understand something a little bit, um, hopefully the respect for the for the um, modality um, is up. So the higher the frequency, the shorter the waves. It's clear it's going to heat up faster. The lower the frequency, there's the deeper penetration. So what does that mean? Well, when you choose a one megahertz frequency, the depth of penetration is going to be about two to five centimeters. And if you choose a three megahertz frequency, the depth of penetration is about one to two centimeters. And so then we start to think about, I mean, you know, this is just an overview, but for example, if I were working with somebody that had a tendonitis, right, the tendons, you know, maybe my bicipital tendonitis in my shoulder, um, 
my um, extensor carpi radialis brevis tendon for lateral pachondylitis. I mean, you know, um, uh, those are fairly close to the surface. And so that I would want my depth of penetration to be less. So I would choose in three megahertz. If I was working on a muscle spasm, for example, in the upper trapezius muscle, which is, you know, a big muscle, I would want to get deeper. I'm going to choose a one megahertz. So that's some of the ideas you got to think about what you're trying to treat and what you want to do. So to treat it, the treatment area, like I said before, you want to, you want to stay within the treatment area. So it's understanding the size and the location. Um, remember that you don't want to move any more than two times, approximately two times, so one and a half to two times the size of the sound head. So if you're trying to cover a big area, it's not going to be effective with, with the head of the ultrasound. You just you really want to keep in mind that it, it should not be any greater than two times the size of the ha, um, sound head. Um, if, you, if you do go to a larger area and just kind of slide it up and down and all around, um, the effective doses is obviously going to be decreased. And, and when you increase the area, the, the area, the fear of hot spots increases like where there could be concentrated heat. So you really want to pay attention to make sure that the head is, um, has full contact with the area you're working on. And you want to be sure then that you're moving it in a slow and steady and a continuous way, not putting um, uneven pressure on the, on the transducer. And then you want to be sure that um, you're not going greater than um, two times the sound head. So you want to maintain constant energy transfer. So you don't want you don't want the patient to burn, and they burn from the inside out. So that means keep the transducer moving, maintain even contact. I just said that. Um, energy concentration of the periostrum can do, produce burns. So be careful. Keep it off bony prominences. Avoid use of intensities higher than the considered therapeutic. High intensities produce cavitation, which may, may create sites of energy concentration or or tear tissue. Um, remember low doses for acute inflammation, um, avoid, um, you know, if the feces are growing, um, or, or growing bone, um, we don't want in any way, um, you know, close growth plates early or encourage the speed up because right, it's heat. And so we understand heat, you know, speeds up on a molecular level. And so we want to pay attention to that. Um, there are precautions um, you want to think about. Um, in the case of um, acute inflammation, fractures, breast implants, patient with any sort of cognitive language or sensory limitations. Um, it doesn't mean necessarily that you don't do it, but, but they have to understand what they're feeling. Um, I've seen it in, the, in a clinic setting where um, a colleague of mine was uh, you know, doing ultrasound and um, the patient was saying, gosh, I feel it getting really, really hot. And they were doing ultrasound to the upper trapezius and um, they, were, they were probably uh, a solid, uh, moving a solid two sizes of the sound head. So probably a bit larger and really you know, trying to get a large area because the, the patient was complaining of pain and muscle spasm. And so using that one megahertz, right, to get that deeper penetration, but they were getting closer to the spine and the, and the person had had a fusion um, and there was metal in, in their neck. And um, so that the, the heat, the electricity, you know, in the ultrasound was, was, you know, attracting the heat from metal. So um, had the therapist not stopped up, a person could get burned, for example. So again, that goes back to our initial, you know, uh, the most important thing we do is observe our patients, look at them while we're interviewing them, and really making sure we're getting all that information so we make the right decision as to what will be best for, um, for um, modalities and what to use. Contraindications, pregnancies, over reproductive organs, over eyes, um, you know, joint cement, avoid uh, areas that have, have a pacemaker. So you can see the list right there. And really, again, the idea that we're speeding up stuff on a cellular level. And so think about all of that and that makes sense as to why um, that list of, of contraindications. I'm going to kind of end with this, um, talking about the OT um, hand evaluation. Um, and, and I guess you could consider it just in general when you're doing an evaluation um, of the upper extremity. You know, you can see their evaluations is in the center and, and there's lots of parts to it. Um, and I think that we all probably do a lot of this so well. It's, you know, we chose this field because we understand the idea of being client-centered. We really, we enjoy and we appreciate um, the uniqueness of the patients and people we come in contact. Um, and I believe that 
it's that piece, our innate curiosity to really figure out what it is that's going on with our patient in this, in this area of practice, certainly physically, that's limiting them from being participatory in what they value. And I think that really getting to know them and in, in, in such a way that, this, uh, that we develop this professional collaborative relationship, um, all that happens right in the beginning. And that helps you decide on what you're, gonna, what you're going to assess and how you're going to assess it and then what intervention that you're going to do. So right in the beginning, right, I, we talked about this, that interview, we talk about pain. Are they using any sort of orthosis? Do they walk with a cane? Do they wear a splint, et cetera? Um, then we look at just watching them. How do they stand? How are they doing? Do they protect their arm? Do they subconsciously rub an area that may have a scar? Are there open wounds? Um, what kind of changes are noted on the skin? You know, so we've established that rapport. We're take, we're doing the interview. We're observing them, and sort of all that happens. Um, we prior to we're taking a history. Um, there's there's a couple ways to do that. Sometimes it's you know reading reading some sort of medical record. Uh, sometimes it's a conversation with another medical professional. And ultimately, I for me it's that. But I'm also asking the patient. And I've I've, I've said to my patients, you know, I understand what happened. You know, I've read I've read your chart or I've spoken to your doctor. But tell me what's going on with you because they they know themselves right and their perception is important so that you can best. Um, have an effect in a positive way for them to improve their function. And again, that's how you determine the, 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 the kind of testing that you're going to do. And um, it involves touching. And so I let them know that we want to feel um, because we can see how tissue is moving, how bones are moving at the joint. Um, and, all, and a lot of that can be done. In one of my classes now, I teach uh, kinesiology. And I was telling a student the other day, I believe I could do the whole evaluation with my eyes closed because I depend so much on what I feel. And, and so um, I think that that's important for us to remember that we have great uh, palpation skills and not to be afraid to use them. So when we think of, of functional performance, um, injuries to the hand really impact upper extremity function. Um, it can interfere with all aspects of a person's life. And of course, that can have a psychological effect as well. Um, so on the initial eval, then you want to talk about what a person can and cannot do and really focus on um, those limitations. The evaluation involves a history, kind of talked about that with that other, with that picture uh, there. Um, look at wounds, talk about pain, talk about range of motion, swelling, sensation, strength, all those things that really come under, I could add a coordination and there's a bunch of others in endurance. Um, they could be listed here as well. Um, but again, all those areas that fall under uh, the biomechanical frame of reference. And I just put in a, um, just a couple of pictures, um, you know, just to get the idea that I value objective data so, so much, you know, and I, I love and fully believe I was meant to be an occupational therapist, but I know I'm best when I can give some exact data. It, it, it gives me confidence. Um, it allows me to be confident with my patients because I'm able to show them progress in an objective way. Um, and I think that that definitely can help um, with the overall progress, it certainly helps in this country too with payment because um, we're we're so we're so beholden to um, you know having to answer to um, guidelines set by insurance companies and specific to time frame etc. So that if we can give those objective measurements, um, that can really help with patient care and getting them the the, the services that they need. So again, the goniometric measures, again, looking at the hand, of course, we measure every joint with a goniometer, um, you know, obviously the shoulder, the elbow, the forearm, um, as well as lower extremities in some cases, um, especially as they pertain to function and seating. Um, you know, I have had to do some with regard to the hip and the knee um, when fitting patients for wheelchairs. Edema can be measured um, in a bunch of different ways. Um, we can use a tape measure. Um, this one here has a piece on it that you can use it to measure circumferential measurements um, as well as um, length of scar. Um, um, the key is when you use tape measure, just as you place it on the, um, when you place it on, on your patient, um, make sure not to tug it too tight. It's not a tourniquet, right? So you just want to lay it over, but then you want to just give it a little bit of a tug so that it's flat against the person's um, skin in terms of the area you're measuring, and that um, you want to be sure you're not overlapping and that you want to read correctly. Um, in your documentation, you want to be clear to, uh, to distinguish by some bony landmark or some um, as to where you're measuring so that if that has to be reproduced, um, it's easily done so. Um, there's other 
uh, ways to look at swelling, that especially if it's more diffuse, um, that um, you can use a device called a, a volumeter and actually just measures the displacement of water and that displacement of water is measured. And, um, and that's how you, so as the uh, less water is displaced when the same area is measured, um, that's, that's denoting a decrease in edema. Pay attention, we talked about this a lot, pitting edema. So when there's pressure for the examiner's finger, leaves an indent or pit when it's removed, and you can see that. Um, you can see that there's a post-op scar uh, happening as well. So again, it goes back to that very beginning, that whole observation, watch what does, what, what does the person's hand or arm look like? Um, did they have surgery? How is that scar healing, et cetera? So you're gonna talk to them, and but while you're talking to them, you're also gonna be doing some observation. And I just put a, a partial, um, you know, um, eval there, but you can start to see, you can make up, have your, but you want to be sure to get, you know, all that kind of information that, um, that you need and then be able to document. Um, so I hope this helped you anyway. Um, it was meant to just kind of give you a general overview, really, uh, certainly not totally inclusive, but definitely it does give you between the two PowerPoints, hopefully a, a general idea of what to look for when uh, considering upper extremity rehabilitation and getting some of the data that you need to, uh, to best determine your plan uh, for your patient. Now, if there's any questions. Thank you so much, Patty. Does anyone have any questions? I'm so fast. I was like, oh my God, I got four minutes. Yeah. No, no. Please unmute yourself if you have a question because I've been muting everyone as they're coming in and out. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, if you don't have any now, but you want, if you think of something afterwards, please feel free to email me and I will forward on those questions to Dr. Myers. Oh, I'd be happy to help if I can, sure. All right, thank you everyone. All right, thank you.